I would like to call the Halifax Elementary School Committee meeting to order on January 3rd at 6.01 p.m. Thank you, Area 58, for filming as always. Um, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, would anybody in the audience like to be acknowledged or scheduled to speak at this time? Go ahead. Just state your name and then. Uh, my name is Kathleen Berry and I reside at 34 Highland Circle. I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly thank our dedicated school committee members for their countless hours that they have devoted to the Halifax community and to the El Halifax Elementary School. This evening, you will make important decisions in regards to the staff at Halifax Elementary, namely substitute and long-term sub substitute wages. Since I've been employed in both of these positions at Halifax Elementary, uh, I feel I'm qualified to share with you some information you may or may not already know about these positions. First, uh, substitute teachers, they're not babysitters. They are responsible for maintaining the classroom routines, including, including teaching lessons outlined by the classroom teacher, as well as taking care of any emergency procedures that may happen during that day. Second, not having substitute teachers to cover for classroom teachers causes a domino effect that impacts the day-to-day -day operations of the school and negatively impacts the learning of our school ed special education students. This is because when a sub cannot be secured, a paraprofessional or special education, education teacher is asked to fill in. Thus, the students who would normally receive these services from these educators cannot receive it. Next, in comparison to the other schools within Silver Lake Regional School District, Halifax Elementary subs are paid the least amount. A substitute teacher is more likely to accept a job at a Kingston or Clinton school than Halifax for this reason. Next, you may not already know this, but long-term subs are required to hold a teaching license and are asked to work outside the regular school day, including but not limited to staff meetings, parent communication, parent-teacher conferences, report cards, lesson preparation, and grading. However, unlike the regular classroom teacher, they are not compensated for this time, nor do they receive sick time, personal days, or vacation time. The first 21 days of employment, a long-term sub is paid a per diem sub rate of $95 per day or a little more than $13 an hour. Minimum wage went up to $15 an hour on January 1st. This means that neither position of a substitute nor a long-term substitute within that first 21 days is receiving currently minimum wage. Also, if a long-term sub accepts a second job during the same school year covering for another teacher, those 21 days start all over again. How can we attract and keep qualified individuals for these positions at these wages? We should not only be competitive within our own district, but also within the educational system and other employment where similar levels of responsibility and education are required. I thank the committee for hearing me out and considering this information that I have shared this evening. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We now need to review and vote the regular minutes of October 3rd, 2022. <coughs> so I need a motion for that, please. Was, wasn't there a question about the vote on that? Yeah, that's why we're re-voting. Over re -voting. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just So I just need a motion to approve the regular minutes from October 3rd. I'll make a motion to approve the regular minutes from October 3rd. 
Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, we have the MOU with the Halifax Police and a possible vote, um, considering the fact that Mr. Keegan's not here tonight, and that was sort of something that he's been working on throughout this school year. I would recommend that we bump that to our next meeting where he can be present and speak on it, if that's okay with the rest of the committee. There's no objection to that. Is everybody okay with that? We don't need okay. We don't need to take a formal vote to move it unless there's an objection. But I just wanted to run it by you guys. Okay. So can we move that to the next meeting, please? Yes, Thank you. Please. And next is uh, discussing the long-term sub rate. Sure. So you may recall last spring I recommended that we consider changing the long-term sub rate um, to uh, paying long-term subs the bachelor step one rate starting day one and to not wait the 21 days. You may recall that the difference at that time was about $3,700 um, by not waiting 21 days to pay them the bachelor step one. We do search for licensed uh, individuals who have bachelor's degrees for these long-term sub positions. Um, and uh, given the fact that we have had some difficulty um, attracting candidates for long-term suppositions, I'm asking the committee to consider uh, this change. So just to be clear, mm -hmm. um, you are asking us to take a vote to allow when we hire a long-term sub to begin at bachelor step one and not wait that 21 days any longer. Yes. Okay. And this is different from the daily sub, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So their um, their bachelor step one uh, was fifty thousand one hundred ninety nine, or two hundred seventy two dollars and eighty two cents. I think was the original estimate um, when we first proposed this. Um, and so the, the difference for 21 days at $272 is about $3,734.22. Um, but at the time that the committee was considering some budgetary concerns, and um, again, they didn't feel that they were in the position to make that kind of a decision at that time. But given our position, we thought it would be worth our, our while to present this to you tonight. The other question I have too is sometimes do long term sub. I mean, there's positions open in the school, right? Many. Many. Okay, so why would another thing, I mean, this is probably, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but maybe if long term subs were, if you can tell them that there's the possibility of being hired full time if everything goes well, you know? Like, I mean, to me, that would be a way to fill positions that would also attract long-term subs, in my opinion, but, um, because I know that hasn't always happened. I mean, you know, because, like, who wants to go to a temporary sort of contract position when there's no hope of any permanence there? True. That's true. I mean, right now, we're looking at six long-term sub positions. And how many open positions do you have? Uh, right now, they... Three are filled and then three are pending because they haven't started yet in return to these. So because it seems like to me that's a great way to hire people. You get to I mean obviously you have to, you know, whether it's you know, but I mean I feel like that would be another thing on top of offering more money is why have someone in the building and have them all trained to be there and then just replace them with the person. But it not all scenarios are an open position. Some scenarios are a leave. So it really is just a set period of time that we can offer for, for, for many of the long-term sub-positions. I think Lauren's point might be, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding, but sometimes when it's a retirement position and it's mm -hmm. advertised as a long-term sub for the remainder of the year, I think we would be best served to instead advertise it as a permanent position. And we'd be better able to attract and retain somebody Rather, I understand returning leave, most likely they're coming back mm -hmm. in the short term. But if it's a retirement, why can't we advertise as a permanent position to fill in for the remainder of the year and then become a you can. teacher? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, <laughs> there's nothing preventing anybody from posting a retirement for as a permanent position in the year. I think there's two schools of thought. Mm -hmm. One school of thought is the position that you just 
articulated, and uh, I think there's some wisdom there. I think the other school of thought is that in modern times, in the springtime, there's just in general more turnover everywhere, and that there's more applicants out there, and that you may be able to get a deeper applicant pool by posting a position in the spring. So I think in some ways it's... Um, yeah, but there's nothing saying you still can advertise. No, you're not tied to that teacher, right? They have to get renewed every year for the first three years of service. So you could always just... You could add, you, they could be a permanent teacher and then say, we don't want to renew you for the fall. That's, that, that goes for every single teacher that's hired for the first three years of their career at any school. So, so I, I understand that's what you're true. saying to get yeah. a bigger pool. But if, if you hire somebody and you're not pleased with what you're seeing from them, you can always just choose to not renew in June. Anyway, it's not like, oh, because we hire them as a permanent teacher, a full-time permanent teacher that we're, you know, can't then. Yeah, don't you know, say it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not saying the yeah. position that you hold is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like I'm saying no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just, there's two ways to think yeah. about it. And that was the, 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 the mindset when this position was posted mm -hmm. that I think that, that was taken. Well, and I just feel like, too, we need to be a little more creative at this point because of the shortages, you know, so any incentives we can provide that not, are not, not necessarily monetary because there's a limit to that, obviously, that, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not a principal, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, you know, but I do think, like, there are incentives that can be given to people, especially when it's really, really hard to hire teachers right now. And I'm all in ears for the incentives. <clears throat> it's just that we've, like uh, David mentioned, it was when we're looking at these retirements that are happening, like mid-year. I mean, this is uh, this is either the fourth or fifth one that we've gone through over the last I don't know, six years, seven years, and so we find that when we posted that as a permanent position mid-year. We don't have a candidate pool that we typically have a candidate against. And that's why seeing in this particular situation we're in right now with six long-term sub-positions, we figured that we would have the possibility of looking at six candidates for that potential. And we've communicated that with all the long-term subs that one of these positions will be a permanent position come the fall. Because it is, because we did have a retirement that happened in big. Is it advertised that way though? Like, no. Because you could just, instead of saying like we have one permanent position open and one person gets that, you could say like who has this many open of long term and then you can all basically interview for who gets the, the one lock, which technically holds the permanent. I thought you had to post it. I thought we like were required to post it. We are. Okay. Any openings have to I be posted. Their discretion is whether they're posting it as long-term sub versus permanent, and I think that's what I was saying. Is like I just think a little bit of like creativity to say let's let's really try to, especially where there's six. So you know maybe if we post some as a permanent position, you'll we'll get more people to even bother to apply because some people will look at long-term sub and not even apply. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. So I think that yeah, that would help. Yeah, definitely, like I said, who would go for a contract position over our current? Right. A, a friend of mine wants to leave her district as an adjustment counselor and asked me about the, a long-term position here and asked if there's a potential for it to be a permanent. And so I have no idea. If that's how it's advertised. That must be what it is. I certainly do. I'm not privy to any inside information. But she was very interested in pursuing a different district. And she didn't bother to apply because it was only long-term sub. So if there was that, you know, availability, like with the teacher retirement, well, there might be a teacher out there too. You know what I mean? That is in the same position that might like to leave their districts, but they're not even going to bother to apply because it's long-term sub. But maybe there's a very qualified teacher who just moved or wants to change districts, and then they see a permanent position that they would apply. So I'm not sure if that was what you meant when you brought it up. It is what I meant. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I just think there's got to be incentives beyond, you know, we should really give as much as we can to attract quality people as opposed to putting a band-aid on it and then hiring again. It's a waste, you know. I don't know what power I have is being provided incentives for attracting people. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, again, again, you have to follow the contract, so you can't provide 
people who are in the contract different benefits than what you offer your contractual employees. And if you're talking about other types of incentives, that would fall to the school committee to budget those types of options. Well, who decides how a position is posted? Typically, the building principals have decided, and the, but now we have a new HR director, and they work with they'll they'll work with Dave in the future to determine how to best. Do you sit down on interviews and make in the decision process? Just for teachers, no. So I mean, I I understand the long term stuff is mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it is just a long term stuff. Well, right, absolutely. But to advertise as long term stuff here, it's a, it's a bargain, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I, I get that it would be a budget issue if we were to now instead of advertising as long term mm -hmm. stuff, we would advertise because they would they, they and even stepping away from the whole topic of bachelor step one, if you're hiring a permanent teacher, they might be bachelor step nine or whatever. So it's going to be a cost increase. But again, to be able to attract and retain teachers here, I think is obviously showing that it's really important. Um, Mr. Beaudry, of the three long-term sub-positions that are filled, do they hold bachelor's degrees in education, or? Um, each of them, I'd, I'd have to look for each specific person, but I know that at least two of them are, have a degree in bachelor's in education. I'd have to check on a third one. So are long-term subs required by the district to have a bachelor degree in general? So, so Dave. So <laughs> we follow the DESE regulations. Yep. DESE, before the pandemic, uh, did not require subs. If you were going to be assigned for 90 school days or less, the need to have a license. When the pandemic uh, started, that was increased to the entire school year. This year, that was extended so that substitutes do not need to be licensed. Okay, so but that's licensure, but what about a degree? Do they need to hold a bachelor's degree? No. Okay, just okay. <laughs> that's, that's not to say but that's I mean, traditionally what yeah. we look for. Yeah, no. That's not to say that yeah. it's not what we're seeking, but yeah. in terms of can we lawfully employ somebody right. in a substitute role without a bachelor's degree? The answer to that question is yes. For now. He told us you changed his mind. <laughs> well, and since this might be a, I hope it's not a dumb question, but since these roles are not filled right now, we're also not paying it right now, correct? And is that well, also, some of these positions, if they're on leave, we're we maybe paying oh, we're for paying their leave, leave. Oh, yeah. got it. as well as the long term. Right. So. so, but we're still, yeah, okay, but we're not paying the extra. So, with this potential vote to change, we would be getting rid of the waiting period to be placed on bachelor step one. Mm -hmm. And then there would be no other changes, like they still would not have sick days, personal days, anything like that? No. Okay. Can we um, entice them a little bit by getting rid of the, like, where does it come? Because they're not, does long-term sub sign a contract? Like, it's not part of the teacher's contract, right? No. So, so can they opt to not attend meetings? Like the, what do you have staff meetings like once a month or something? Mm -hmm. Could they not be required to? Would that be something that we could give them since they're, you know, not making the same, they don't have all the uh, benefits of the fully employed teachers? Could they be allowed yeah, I, to? I think that would be you know? their own choice and decision if they choose not to. I, they're all invited as well. Yeah, okay. I would assume they understand the role of the position when they take it. I don't think I've ever had anyone refuse to attend any yeah. grade level meetings or staff meetings yeah. or anything like that. I think it would be to their detriment if they didn't personally as a teacher. But I don't Maybe know most, a lot of times long term subs are, are interested in a <coughs> permanent position and they want to be at those meetings and grade level meetings and staff meetings. And so, so my question is, is budgetary because there are so many positions. It would it just be a difference of three thousand seven hundred and thirty-four dollars? It would be that times six. Mm -hmm. So, I ask you. That's then in addition to what we're paying for the person on leave. On leave, and then the sub, the long-term sub, 
So this will, this will, just, this will be just increasingly painful long term stuff. So. Right. So my question to you is, does that put us in a tricky position in our budget, or is it something that we can sustain? Because that's where the conversation went last time and why we didn't move forward with it is because we simply could not afford it. It's not because the need isn't there. Because clearly the need is there. There's at least one retirement, right? So we're not paying for leave for all of the six. It's one retirement or two? One retirement. Just one retirement. So, I mean, at least but there's also one. payouts that go along with retirement. And we build retirements into the budget. So we, yeah. uh, last year we already had built that mid year to the budget. So it can be tricky because, you know, depending on how long they're going to last, but I understand the need may outweigh yeah. some of those other questions. And if this is what we need to do, then we may have to, we may have to make other decisions. To well, it's probably end. impacting education. Not right, we have to do staffing. the right thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then we would have to make other modifications and hold up with some of the purchases until it's a better time for that. I mean, it's a matter of prioritization, which I feel like... So what if we sort of found middle ground that, like, if not everybody holds a bachelor's degree, we could kind of hold them to that standard. Like, if you actually have a bachelor's degree, then we could put you immediately on bachelor's step one. But if they don't hold any kind of degree, then we could have a waiting period. I mean, can we do that? Like, so. You could. You should know that the other districts have waived the 21 days, and they have moved towards everyone starting at a bachelor's step one for their long-term subs. So Plimpton, Kingston. Silver Lake, they all made the switch. Do they um, have an easier time hiring long term stuff? It depends on what they're they're looking for. So again, there's certain areas that have been more difficult. As you know, we've had a very difficult time <coughs> hiring a school psychologist, and we've been using contracted services for that. Well, so how much does that cost? <laughs> so that's, just, that's not an agenda item. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, well, I mean, but that's, you know what I mean? Like, literally, like, so if the services are being paid for anyway, somehow, because we have to provide them, is this the most cost-effective way to possibly... It's not necessarily cheaper to go through contracted services, no. Well, no, I'm sure it's not cheaper. No. What I'm saying is, like, could this be our most cost-effective way of managing the situation if we're paying for contracted services? We appreciate that. Um, we hope that it will help. That brings me to item number six, which is the daily sub rate and a possible vote. Um, we, we do have a, um, I believe we have a, as Katie mentioned, uh, an issue here with um, making sure that we're meeting um, minimum wage. And we have proposed moving from $95 to $107 per hour. This would bring us to $16.04 per hour. Uh, this rate change was recently approved at Plimpton Elementary School to be retroactive for um, January 1st because they will do it, um, they will actually have a, a vote in January. So they, they are, it looks as if they are gonna move in this direction. This is the proposal that we will make to, to all of our communities. So um, recognizing that Minimum wage went up on January 1st. If you were to approve this, we would ask that you approve it retroactive to January 1st. How does that compare to other districts? So, so you, you know, if somebody's getting a call for yep. Summer Lake District versus Marshfield, are they willing to? Dave, where they Dave to took a look at some of the com competitive rates in local communities and uh, tried to, to find a, 
the, the best spot for us in comparison with other districts. Um, I think there's a couple challenges. Uh, I think this is, any sort of comparison, it's going to be higher than some, lower than others. Uh, I think the thought into this, how we arrived at this number was one, trying to get consistency across the district so that we're not competing with each other. Um, obviously, we want to be compliant with uh, the wage law. And the other thing I think we want to be mindful of is that we wouldn't want uh, people who are permanent employees to be making more money as a substitute. Potentially. So, for example, if somebody was a paraprofessional, a first year paraprofessional, we wouldn't want somebody to be a permanent job, to take a substitute job. So, we wanted to make it uh, high enough so that we were competitive with districts that we're complying a lot. But not where we potentially are going to lose permanent employees mm. to take temporary positions. So, this is what that's kind of that sweet spot, sorry. That was our best attempt to find a sweet spot. Okay, thank you. I'll make a little yeah. challenge. Yep. Okay, I'll make a motion to um, retroactively um, increase the daily sub rate to $107 per day. Is that All the favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> okay, uh, warrants are circulating. Do you have a single signature warrant update? Yeah, so tonight there are eight warrants circulating, totaling $833,689.80. Uh, in addition, there are two cafeteria warrants with that as well. And then there are also payroll warrants that we need for the town hall. Uh, on November 8th, seven warrants totaling $385,810.69 were signed in the town hall by Justin Page. Thank you. And also on December 5th, eight warrants totaling $265,199.59 were sent to the town hall and then signed by Justin Page once again. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I signed every page. Um, correspondence and reports, I don't have anything at this time. New business, I have nothing. Does anybody have anything? Unfinished business. Um, so Go ahead. Thank you. I, well, it's just random things that I don't know if that's a good time to ask about. Um, one is, was the school council up and running, Mr. Uh We're planning a meeting coming up in January. And still looking on a community member. Still looking for a community member? Yeah. Sometimes we've had like police department has stepped up. But, mm -hmm. so. but you have staff and parent? Okay. okay. So you haven't met yet this year then? No. I don't know, it's a little random, but Mr. Keegan had asked Mr. DeSantis to attend. And thank you for attending, Mr. DeSantis. But I kind of checked around, and I don't know that assistant principals necessarily attend. So I don't know if we want to wait and have Mr. Keegan speak to it next time. But I don't know. I just feel that they have a lot of students and a lot going on. And I don't know what the norms are surrounding that, if we want to talk about that, about who should attend meetings or who's required to attend the meetings. I uh, wanted to have that conversation so that Mr. DeSantis doesn't have to come and eat. Okay. Um, needs to be here. <laughs> so, so again, um, generally the, the principals attend. Uh, there are certain events or issues that sometimes we'll ask the assistant principals to attend as well. But you're correct. Oftentimes we'll have one or the other attend because they do have early mornings and um, they, they try to divide and conquer some of their evening um, obligations. Um, but again, so I mean, I don't know how much the committee members feel. We can ask Mr. Keegan to kind of follow up next time if he wishes. But I mean, I appreciate you coming, Mr. Santos. But I don't see the need. I think Mr. Beaudry can answer for anything that needs to be addressed at the school. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, <laughs> and then the other thing, I was just wondering when we, like our committee, gets a chance to give input to the school calendar? Like, 
so that it's not that it comes to us and then we vote for it. Like, is there a chance, and when is that chance for us to get into that? When the superintendent brings the draft calendar to the committee tonight. Oh. Okay. Is that, was that on the agenda? Yep. Yes. Oh, I missed it. Okay. Thank you. And every year, the superintendent brings the draft calendar to all of the committees to discuss and vote on. Uh, unfinished business, I think we sort of just covered that. Future agenda items, always welcome to email me. Uh, of course, make sure you CC the superintendent and uh, Karen Tringali with any correspondence regarding school committee matters. Um, report of standing committees, policy did not meet, although there was a discussion about potentially meeting in the future. Negotiations we will discuss in executive session following tonight's meeting. Um, were we going to discuss possibly moving me into the second for that? I don't think we should have that discussion without a full committee present. All right. Um, but yes. Okay. Um, just because I don't know what his opinion on it is and that's where okay. he sits right now. Okay. Um, PAC, I don't, who has PAC? I don't have my reorder chart in front of me. Is it him that has PAC? Okay, so he did not provide me with a report and he did not provide me with one for youth and rec either. So we'll have to update that at our um, February, we have a meeting in February, right? Yeah, February meeting. PTO? Uh, the last meeting mostly um, revolved around getting ready for the Mingling Jingle. Um, and it was great, we tried to um, incorporate um, several different religious holidays into the celebration with crafts and decorations. And so most of the conversation was around that. They canceled the December meeting. Um, the president's position is still open. Christina Wilson is still residing, just, you know, until someone else can be found to replace her. Thank you. Um, capital budget has not met, but we're going to start budget preliminary budget discussion tonight. Um, admin review. There is a date. Okay. Um, it is January thirty first. Six to seven. That first floor person. Let's see. Oh, that was last year. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong calendar year. It's hard to use. January 12th, 5.30. Okay. And that is... It appears to be in person. Okay. Where? At the high school. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, curriculum review has not met. Union 31, we met and had a joint meeting, which I believe everyone was present for because every committed, commi committee was invited. Um, again, I want to thank our department heads, uh, Marie Grable and Steve Pello and Marissa, M Melissa Farrell for all coming together and um, giving their overview of where they think the district is at from the last year and where they foresee us heading in the future. I think it's very valuable and I, now that we do it all jointly, it seems to be a much more efficient method of moving forward. Um, it's a lot of information for all of us to digest and of course, um, they're always very open to any kind of communication that if we have any questions and thank you for being here tonight, Ms. Grable. We also discussed the school's start time working group gave us a little bit of an update of where they're at. That's still in the works. Um, there was a brief discussion about the calendar and sort of um, where each committee uh, saw the calendar 
going and if there would be any changes moving forward, but we're gonna talk about that at the end of our agenda tonight. And then there was a brief discussion about student surveys, but that um, will get kicked back to the policy subcommittee because that would, any change in the way that we conduct surveys in the district would require a policy change, which needs to come from the policy subcommittee. So, did you say anything about that meeting? That's good. Okay. Uh, next is Mr. Bodry. I have very little just because of the budget discussion, so I, but I just wanted to recognize that we have um, three babies that have come <laughs> through. Uh, Sperma had her baby, and Miss Parker, and Miss all had a baby in between December and January. So, wow, it's um, exciting. I've been doing well, and wanted to point out the fact that uh, Mrs. Mullen and her retirement had over 26 years a year and over 30 years in education. So she missed the last day was on the 23rd. It was the 23rd. So it's a big issue to fill in this case. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Healy. Thank you. In your electronic package tonight, there was the financial. And just a few highlights I wanted to print out is right a very first detail page you see a different <coughs> dollars for indemnification. That's for the policy that we have that covers the school committee when they act as a group with um, Union with Union 31. Because each town has their own policy for the school committees, but it's when they act as Union 31 there, there was a gap there. So that's what that policy is for. And when my budgeting I was fifty dollars off because we actually paid for an additional month this year. We had um, a delay <coughs> we paid for a month and we paid for the year, so there's a slight difference there. Um, in the technology section, you'll see this is one deficit in one of the accounts of $1,200. The technology budget will not be overrun. We will we will just keep that in mind as we're working within the budget. There was a change to one of the uh, per student rates that was we did not know about at the time that we budgeted for last year. Um, electricity account, which is <coughs> it's a the bottom page two. That's been showing deficit all year, and based on the activity last year, that's what I to be happy for this year. And as of the December bills, it still looks like we're going to, we're going to land in a deficit there. So I'll fill that into next year's budget. I'm going to that line for next year's budget. Um, but within this year's budget, there will be a surplus in that area as a total, because a deficit one in the gas account. There's a small deficit in one of our tutoring accounts, but that's really just as needed, so we can't really predict that, that's just as we need to do. It's always $207. And then as you go down through the special education area under contracted services, there is a deficit of $44,000. And that is because that's what we're paying for the services, the contracted services for the school psychologist. But we, we are seeing that salary is not being spent. So that will offset that deficit to the end of the year. And then under special education, also under tuition, you'll see there's a deficit of $333,000. Don't be alarmed, please. Um, that was before our circuit breaker funds came in. We did get confirmation of our circuit breaker funds. And I did want to say that we received um, almost $900,000 for tuition and transportation. So last year we had a significant issue with transportation uh, overage. And we were reimbursed for some of those costs. So that's making a significant impact to this year. And then also to the 24 budget. And then out of district vocational, there's a surplus there because only three of the students that we had budgeted for are attending. That's it for right now, unless there are any hmm. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you. So under curriculum instruction and assessment, we just have an update on how we're using our um, student support survey this year. So inside the packet, I've included uh, a memo just to outline uh, this year's plan on using uh, our student survey. The purpose of surveying our students uh, is to ensure we're meeting uh, every student's needs and also evaluate the progress of our social emotional learning curriculum so you know we implemented the second step uh, in September of 2000. Um, the panorama, panorama survey which we utilized last year that's aligned to second step. Um, I wanted to share with this committee that our plan to administer that survey what occurred in February of this year, grades three through 12, obviously only three through six is relevant to this committee, but just sharing the overall memo. Uh, just like last year, students would take it online in school. It takes 25 minutes to complete. Uh, a survey focuses on relationships, uh, 
meaning like, uh, do I feel like there's an adult I can connect with at school, um, goal setting, growth mindset, and other topics. All of the questions are linked um, inside the document that I've provided. So our plan would be to communicate uh, our intent to continue to use the survey uh, via email. Inside that document, we would share all of the questions. Families would have an opportunity uh, to opt out, just like last year, if they didn't want to have their student take it. Uh, included would be how the results are used, the way that results are used. Classroom teachers would see uh, how students responded in the topics of growth mindset, grid, self-management, self-efficacy, social awareness. So you can see those are the topics that the questions cover. And then uh, also the school support team um, would have access to that information to make sure that all students' learning needs are met. And in the past we had talked about, there were questions about uh, student privacy and safeguarding data, so I put a link inside of the memo that provides a little bit more information about that. But I wanted to provide uh, the committee with an overview of our plan. Uh, we discussed this at our admin team. The principals agreed that it was a helpful tool for them to use. Last year we did have, um, we surveyed in the lower elementary grades as well. But the way that survey is conducted is it's based on like teacher impression versus actual student responses. So you can imagine that students below uh, grade three would have a hard time responding to a survey because of emerging literacy skills and things like that. So our administrative team made the decision to just use it in grades uh, three through 12 so that students would have the opportunity to respond based uh, on their thinking. So that's our plan for this year. I also just included a screenshot of what it might look like at the school level, the data that comes back. It's compiled by the topics I talked about, growth mindset, grit, self-management. Students reported that they felt like they didn't have, um, you know, had a hard time advocating for themselves or didn't believe that they could improve their performance with effort. There, they would be grading themselves lower, like the light green, and teachers could see, like, oh, this um, the student believes that you know their ability is fixed, and how else could we design learning experiences to show that with effort we can learn? So that's the kind of information that's provided. I think sometimes just showing you what the information looks like could be helpful, so that you would know how it's used. So wanted to share this with you and all the committees to let you know. What our, how, what our plan is in using uh, the student services. I feel like these surveys are very important given some recent tragedies, you know, given like if you look at the questions at the end of, um, you know, your feelings and help from other people, do you have somebody you can confide in? And, you know, I think that those are essential things to know for all of our students because know what's going on in someone's head and I hope that students feel comfortable answering honestly like I look at all these questions and I think they're tremendous as far as understanding some supports that could be you know could hopefully change some outcomes so if the teachers get the, feed, the data collected as their class or the individual students are tied to the individual students they see their Responses. Correct. So, yeah. if you're a fifth grade teacher, you would see just the students in your class. You would get a general view mm -hmm. like this that says, "This is your class." Then there's also so under each topic, mm -hmm. like growth mindset is a topic. Mm -hmm. Then under that, um, it would it would provide a student. It would sort of give you a rating of where that student. Uh, falls in your class, yeah, there's those colored bands. So if a student's self-reported um, view of growth mindset were like green, yellow, or red, that would give the teacher um, that information. The, there's never a, you can 
can never see how an individual question was answered, but there are six questions oh, that speak okay. to growth mindset, so you don't know how, no one ever sees an individual response, but the okay. responses are tabulated to okay. give a score based on all of those questions. One of the questions inside the, the wellness piece talks about students like your, um, your strengths and um, ask kids to identify their own strengths and if like, the students would itself identify that they have no strengths, the teacher would be able to see that too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a good piece of information to have. We, we don't think that the survey is a single catch-all. It would just be part of um, one of the tools because during the middle of the year, we would imagine that our teachers have a very good sense of where our students are at, but to ensure that we have as much information as the teacher has as much information as possible, we see this as one more layer of just trying to verify that. When you can see trends, you know, hopefully, you know, see, I mean, you know, mental health is a big concern right now. See how the general population That's the intent because mm -hmm. we would ask every student and family to take it. So the intent would be to to try to get that sense. This might be weird. I don't know. Like, but <coughs> is it possible that you could have parents fill out surveys? Well, I don't know. If it, like, I mean, we might be getting into like medical stuff because you fill out things with the doctor. But like, something where a parent could possibly reach out because like some of these questions like. Do you have a teacher or other adult from school who you can count on to help you no matter what? That's a question I'd like to ask my own children. You know, like, is there someone you feel you can be yourself around? Like, these questions are important for conversations, I think. And, you know, you think you, I mean, I know kids are not very open, like, <laughs> they're teenagers, but I feel like if you even start to have the conversation, and a non I, I don't know, or maybe we can do a parent night or something, I don't know, but like just something, like things to ask your kids, like these questions are fantastic. Once you get upset, how often can you get yourself to relax, for instance? You know, these are, like that's a telltale of anxiety, you know, and, and things like that where, you know, like, because I mean, I'm sure a lot of parents are like, I don't even know what to ask my kids, you know, because they're, you know, how's your day? <laughs> I mean, everyone's gotten that response, you know? <laughs> so, but like, I find that more specific questions give you more specific answers. So even if they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about, you know, like at least you asked, which I think always makes everyone feel at least recognized and seen. And I'm not saying like, you know, but just as far as, you know, helping our students, especially, you know, there's, we still have not seen all of the, um, you know, we're still going to see the fallout from the pandemic for years for children, well, for adults too. And so anything we can do to encourage communication and openness and acceptance, I think would be good. So I don't know if that's something, like, I mean, just to even, you know, well, I guess even sharing these questions and saying, you know, maybe talk to your kids about these questions or something, I don't know. Mr. Lynch, you had mentioned, and I want to thank you for adding, um, or including information uh, about just being more transparent with the survey in general. That was clearly a concern of mine when we first initiated this, so I'm thankful that you were mindful of that when you're providing that information to parents. Um, I noticed in our memo there is a link to these questions as we're mm -hmm. looking at them now. Is that also in the information that's going out to parents? So, I mean, parents, I guess, at that point can take it upon themselves to, you know, to your point. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if you can just include that in the memo. Like, feel free to ask your kids some of these questions. There's yeah. great questions in there. You know, they might, or ask someone else to ask your kids. He's more like, they're more likely to talk to you. Yeah. You start the bottom. Who do you trust? <laughs> but I don't know, just thoughts. Sure. But I do think they're great questions, honestly. You can check in. Is this the final draft of the survey? And yes. This, this would be, it would be comparable to the, it's the same one we used last year. So it would give us sort of a trend line. We gave it twice last year, but there was a slight improvement over the course of the year, but we think we can 
get the information in with just doing the survey one time. You um, have to think time of year also would impact the answers in January. <laughs> 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 well, that's also, I think, actionable too. Like, it's you're getting a sense in the middle of the year, you have time to improve or improve even more. So, we think with a single administration, this would be the, the time to do it. And then, before state testing starts in you know, March and April, it would be better to. Taking the whole survey, but there, I don't know if you're open to any change at all. But I just the performance in school, um, where it says whether a person does well or poorly in school, may depend on a lot of different things. I think that's just a hard sentence because that's so subjective. Because somebody's really well might be somebody else's poorly, and vice versa. So I just I would love to. I don't think that sentence even needs to be there. I don't even see that it really fits anyway, but I just think that that's really hard to think about because to judge yourself, well, maybe my best might you know, be somebody else's worst, or maybe my worst is someone else's best. And I think that's so hard to use those objective terms with kids because then you're, it's, a, it's inherently comparing to somebody else when you talk about doing well or poorly. It's all about the best you can be, so I don't know. I just, if you're willing to take any feedback, I would love to. And I don't think the sentence needs to be there anyway. I think that you can just start with your next sentence and just get rid of that sentence altogether. I just always get sensitive about thinking about comparing students and thinking about when you say you're doing well, you know, what that, what that actually means. Because it definitely means different things to different kids. But thank you for sharing it with us, um, giving us a chance to review it. Do you have anything else? I don't. That's the Okay. Thank you. Dr. Pru. Okay. Just a couple of things um, for the district update. We don't have an MSBA project on our radar. But just so that you know, we did receive um, a, a notice from the Board of Directors to pause the 2023 Accelerated Repair Program. So they were not going to be taking any new projects this year under the Accelerated Repair Program. So I've just been announcing that to each of the school committees. Um, the other item is Thank that you, we did the majority of our yes, repairs already. Yes, <laughs> um, we did have a um, a training session with our our building administrators, um, with uh, Attorney Kim Roach from Du Parade Law. Um, changes to student discipline under Mass General Law Chapter 71, 37H, and three quarters. There are now additional steps that have to be taken in order for suspensions to be lawful. Um, so. Uh, the, legislator, the legislation now requires school districts to regularly implement alternative remedies such as mediation, conflict resolution, restorative justice, and or collaborative problem solving prior to suspension, and for schools to document the use of such alternative re remedies. And so a, a bulk of that training, although this wasn't the only thing we talked about in terms of discipline with Attorney Roach, was really about the need to document what steps have been taken prior to resorting to suspension. Um, it should be noted, though, that these additional requirements do not apply to Mass General Law Chapter 7037H for infractions involving assault of staff, possession of weapons, or the possession or distribution of controlled substances. The additional requirements do not also apply to Mass General Law Chapter 7137H and a half, which is related to felony charges and convictions. So those, those ins incidents do not require additional steps to be taken prior to suspension or removal from school. So is that information going to be sent out to parents for a chance for that? Um, those things will be reflected in changes to the handbook. So when we make handbook changes, any language surrounding 37H and three quarters, that language will be updated. But that's not something that we would necessarily send out to parents um, okay. separately. Okay. And where that's a lot more work for administration is that just getting added on to their roles and responsibilities, or is there any way to? Well, it's um, it? 
<laughs> so I, again, it's more documentation, but I think that our principals um, do uh, do a do good job of trying to find alternatives to suspension. We all recognize that the more time a child spends out of class, the more likely they are to fall behind and the more likely they are to disengage or feel connected to school, and that really doesn't serve anyone well. Um, so thinking about those kinds of alternatives. So uh, yes, I, I do think it's in some ways more additional documentation. Um, but I think the intent, uh, if I recall, uh, Jason, Jason Frazier is on the Silver Lake School Committee and um, really uh, he, he did a great job of explaining how the, the legislation came to be in terms of, as part of a, a larger mental health um, concern and also recognizing you know, the, when students drop out of school they're more likely to become a, a problem in society and more likely to end up in trouble with the law. So this is a way to to really force schools to think about alternatives to suspension because no, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Just another mm -hmm. thing on their plate to try to document and find different alternatives. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to undermine the work that they have to do, but it is <laughs> they're ready. <laughs> no, I, I think it's. I think what Jill had said it's just reflecting on. You know the intent of you know really assessing like what we have done to try and remedy the situation. It's being documenting what we have attempted and tried, and um, it's really holding us accountable. Not just say, "Oh, you're suspended. See you later." So, it's, it's good so the next thing we have for you is our preliminary budget presentation, um, which I think we will present up here for the the benefit of viewers at home who don't have access to the presentation on their, their laptop. And um, I, I will start us off by recognizing that the, the process that goes into creating this budget, as you know, in the fall we begin very early where we ask the principals to reach out to their staff to find out what their needs are. Our principals work with um, uh, their custodial staff and Matt Durkee as well to talk about possible capital plan projects and their needs for the um, upcoming school year, but also to create a capital plan that spans several years, um, trying to anticipate some of our future needs. As you know, we also um, looked to Marie Grable and she uh, gave her presentation with a, a special education overview of um, the different programs throughout the district and Melissa Farrell uh, gave a, a budget review and then Steve Pello also uh, introduced a number of programs and uh, requests for the upcoming year in terms of technology. Once we have all of those requests, we meet as a, um, an administrative team. We review it. We ask questions. Um, we ask Kane to prioritize or explain his thinking on certain uh, items that he has proposed. Uh, Christine then goes in and um, moves over uh, things like staffing and utilities and those types of costs. And that brings us to our preliminary budget for this year. Uh, we always look at um, what our academic and developmental needs are for our students. We look at trying to maintain class sizes and the structures necessary for effective instruction. And the building principal does a great job of highlighting uh, class sizes uh, in his narrative, but also some of the structures and concerns that he has for the upcoming school year. Uh, we also like to be mindful and consider and respond to the fiscal conditions of the towns. Uh, and we also, um, for this reason, we looked at what it would take for level services. And um, I wanted to note that we did add the DLC, Developmental Learning Center, in the fall. So that is a, a new program here in Halifax. But we'll, we'll share uh, some of those um, benefits with you as we begin our, our budget presentation. Uh, but we wanted to remind you of that because that was a new addition this year. Um, the DLC program here in Halifax. Um, and then we also look to make sure in what ways do, do these priorities support the strategy for district improvement? Are we moving in the same direction and will they help us to achieve our goals? So um, we'd like to try to give you an overview of some of the traditional types of information that we share with you at this point, some of the assumptions that are built into this preliminary budget. Uh, we have estimated circuit breaker at 70% or $500,532. Uh, 
regular day reflects a 5.25% increase of uh, $315,177. Um, special education tuition and transportation re reflect a 4.27% decrease. Substitutes are at FY23 levels and utilities have been um, updated. The total budget is an increase of 2.12% or an increase of $192,071 more than last year. That's to maintain our current programming and staffing. This does not include any additional staffing. Uh, you'll notice if you look at the preliminary budget detail, you'll see some resource allocate reallocation to address priorities. You'll notice some areas where the budget has there's less money being spent in other areas where we anticipate more money being spent. We do not have any known retirements at this time for FY24. Uh, we have included an estimate or a placeholder for a school psychologist, which we were not able to um, hire this year, at least not yet. Um, we have uh, a out of district vocational represents about five placements. We have three currently in programs. We have one student graduating, and um, so we have about two additional place, placements, but we won't know the exact numbers until April 1st. So this, again, is an estimate. Not included or updated in this budget. We have some shared cost included, but it has not been updated to reflect any new FY24 shared cost budget changes. Um, we have additional staffing requests that Principal Beaudry will speak to uh, this evening. It, there are some potential enrollment increases that we may not be able to anticipate. For example, kindergarten is notoriously difficult to give accurate numbers or um, estimates in terms of enrollment. And uh, we have not taken a reduction for the REAP grant. We're hoping uh, that that will come in about 35 $35,000 and we would be able to take a reduction in technology hardware for about that amount. But again, that's an estimate and it is not reflected in this budget that you see in front of you tonight. So now I'm going to turn it over to Principal Beaudry who's going to give you some insights into his narrative and some of his um, requests. Uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, this here is just projected class size enrollment from 22-23, the current year, where we have 555 students enrolled. Uh, we're looking for 23-24 to maintain the current uh, setup that we do have, we're having four classes at each grade level. Um, you can see the large, largest class going on in grade six, um, and estimating our incoming kindergarten at 75, we estimate our enrollment to go down, actually to 526 students per Do you have, um, to me it seems like enrollment's been going down every year. Mm. Yes. So, um, do you have like how, what, and how much it's gone down every year? Because I know you can't really predict kindergarten, but if you look down the numbers, I mean I know there's some higher ones, but. The last four years, we've been right in mid to high 60s, uh, but yes, I, I want to say my first year as principal, we were definitely over 600. Mm -hmm. I've been 610, I've been for 615. Oh, oh. <coughs> it's weird. There's like bubbles of like a few grades that have really large class sizes and then they get really small when they're really large. Yeah, for it's a good point. I mean, it has gone down. Those are pretty large models that we have there. Um, fourth grade, I want to say, current <coughs> which is at 86, that's, I think has been probably typical for Halifax since I've been here for the 12 years I've been in school, which, you know, is, is a pretty decent enrollment. We're looking at 20, <coughs> but then we had a big bubble, grades five and six, and then we had smaller bubbles that have come in six times. 
So in a lot of ways, class size is really, that's what we do with how many kids are in the grade, as opposed to, you know, like it's something that it can't be very well regulated because we're going from 17 to 26, which is a huge difference. Mm. And I almost wonder, I don't know, like, <coughs> Would it ever be possible to move teachers around to accommodate that? Which I know I hate to, you know, to maybe like have five teachers for grade that has one. I mean, it's a big point at this point, but. but. But I think that will, if you, let's say you take a low number like 66, grade three, if you would have dropped that down to three, you're increasing that number as well. So. Oh, I know, but. We contemplated that. Yeah. We like our class size is really low in the early grade. Okay. So. And that power of grade six was high, but it was never that high. Yeah. It was like in the mid to low 90s when they were in kindergarten, when we look back. But it seems like they just, for whatever reason, that grade is just a lot of <laughs> There's been the most transition. <laughs> I'm just curious, because overall, the moment seems down, but then it's, you know, looking at the different numbers, you know, it's. Because, like I said, yeah, I mean, I was PTO for the learner well over 600 the whole time, right. and that's a big difference right. across the grades, you know? So, and I wonder if that's something that should be accounted for budgetary-wise, you know, that we are decreasing enrollment, because a lot of, you know. But there's also potential for new housing happening on the horizon here, so I certainly don't want to like, think about No, I just, yeah. No, I'm not, I just, yeah. I mean, it's just all things kind of consider, I think. Kings, Kings, in my understanding, is going up the enrollment. Mm. Kings you know, Elementary. And then Plumpton, I think, is so small. Like, uh, three, three students and then increases their numbers pretty quick. Uh, yeah, we have definitely seen a decline. It will be the smallest number that I, I've seen. Yeah, 526 is almost 90 less than, you know, that's. Mm. Absolutely. I think when I first started 12 years ago, it was 625, 630. And then I, years before that, I think it was close, well over 700. So, uh, here we just have some notable increases or decreases in the budget. Uh, so we just kind of broke them down into three areas with the classroom, tech, and the facility. So uh, here in the first column there with the, the classroom, the textbook line item decreased by 66%, which was uh, approximately $65,000. That's because the ELA adoption that we recently had with the collaborative classroom over the last two years. The next one there is the instructional software. That's an increase of 25%, which is about $12,000. Uh, that's due to adding an accelerated reader to help go with Schoology. Um, accelerated reader, help them know our new. Um, those are the support for the new ELA. Um, and Schoology is something that we have had for a number of years. It's just we want to continue to keep that on, um, especially with our fifth and sixth grade students. Mm -hmm. I'm we, sorry, what, how much does Schoology cost? Uh, or, I'm sorry, I thought that was in there. I thought you said it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's fine. It is. It's like, <laughs> Uh, and you almost found for there. 2,800. Thank you. Uh, that was, my reading is correct? Yep, 2,800. Yeah. Just, I, I, thought, I mean, that's not a ton of money. It's just Google Classroom is free, you know, and I don't know if the teachers would be willing to try to change platforms, but it's just something to consider. But. It's, I didn't know how much the money was. You know, I didn't know what, what the number was. Definitely been out there, the yeah. conversation that yeah. we had. Um, but we definitely have some teachers that are very passionate yeah, about using Schoology. Yeah. I we want to kind of make sure that they're providing them with the tools that they, they right. use. Right. Was it $3,000 or was it $28,000? Right. You know, I just right. didn't know what that number was for sure. Well, then, well, I guess something for like, like that for classroom. But I mean, as far as the versions, are teachers still reaching out to the PTO? to cover, because I know there are a lot of programs that will like the anti-bullying program and stuff that we haven't had in the school for a long time. Like, are these relationships being, because I know there was quite a few things we used to cover with PTO, which would ease the school budget somewhat. And I don't, 
I don't know, is that still happening? Like, yeah, teachers don't. But that's part of the idea of we can sign in for, okay, and some of them are software. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. You may not have the answer to it, but um, you know, every few years we cycle through different uh, curriculum updates. Like one year it'll be English, next year we'll buy all math textbooks, next year it'll be science. Uh, it doesn't appear like this upcoming fiscal year that we are looking to just <coughs> make a major textbook purchase. However, in the past I found it beneficial knowing that that was on the horizon and we would split that cost between two years. So I didn't know if we know sort of what's coming down the pipe two, three years from now, if there's any way that we could ease the pain towards that, if that conversation was part of this budget cycle. I'm not sure if Melissa had mentioned it uh, mm -hmm. in her presentation. I don't know if she mentioned it in her presentation, but she does have a group looking at different science resources. Yeah, but science I'm, this year, and then there'll be a math review, I think. but. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's on the scale of a an ELA adoption, but I think we can go back and look at it. Yeah. It's a good question. See if we can split it over. Yeah, just to throw it out there just because I feel like sometimes we get hit with like seventy five thousand yeah. dollars and it's such a, a big chunk of our budget that it just seems to lessen the blow if we have a little wiggle room to even split it in half. That seems to help us quite a bit that one year we did that. Yeah, well, that makes sense. It seems exciting to have. Right, well, that's why I was like, ooh, and then it's like, ooh, yeah, but that's going to come to my chin in a couple of years. Yeah. It is. It is a big hit, but I, I know Melissa, she tries to stay ahead of the game. Yeah, she's awesome. I think she did split this one, the collaborative class one over two years, but it's still a pretty big ticket item that we have there. Okay. I think science is up next. And then here we have in the tech in the middle column, there's a slight increase in uh, school management software. Uh, and the tech management software increases. Uh, and then we're just putting in the, we have the power school that was not included in the FY23. Uh, there's some additional subscriptions and new software tools that uh, Steve Pellow had presented at the Drug School. school and then reprint, we're not sure yet. We anticipated it would be around $35,000, but that also helps offset uh, some of our tech budget. And facility related custodial supplies, we're seeing an increase of 16%, which is approximately $4,000. So that's not actually a negative then? No. No, it's, oh, a, it's a approximate. approximate yeah. All right. All right. Approximate. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the building supplies, <coughs>
because our numbers were definitely not. I didn't come to Ireland. They used to come over here. I think last year. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. last year they did. So we've always had an after school um, in where Plumpton and Kingston students would, would do that afterwards. But Plumpton put it in the budget last year, and it's during the school day that they have um, students that are involved with it. I've talked to Principal Benito, and he had reported that there's, there's a lot of good success there. So how does that work? Like, so if a student wants to play an instrument, they have time during the day. Like, where would that be put? Is that during specialists? That's or? probably the tricky part. One, it's working with whoever that staff member is and when they're available. Because I know, particularly at Plumpton, they um, have certain days that they have instrument available. So that we would obviously we would love to partner with Plumpton because that person is part time there. But if we could. Uh, do so with that. Then. And we say students provide their own instruments still? I'm not sure about that. Because that's another thing that would be an equity issue. You know, if someone wants to play and it's available, but they can't afford the instruments, which would be another tax app that would get provided for. You know? Because I don't know if we want people sharing. Right. I think with Clinton, too, what's their enrollment? Yeah, so I think a point for position can get to all the kids that want to learn music. If we were to do that here, we would need more than a point for position. You know what I mean? I think that we would need, I don't see I mean, how they could get to service all the children that would be interested with just a part-time position at our school. You know? Do you have numbers on how many people have signed up for after school, or are you still doing that? Sorry, I think, because I think music is really important. Like, no, I think the Plimpton, just to add a little bit of details, the, the Plimpton position, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a 0.6 yep. full position. 0.4 of those FTEs are devoted to music instruction, like general music. 0.2 are instrument. Mm -hmm. So we have twice as many, if this were to go forward, Halifax would have twice as many uh, FTEs devoted toward uh, instrumental. instrumental. Mm -hmm. The point six at Plymouth <laughs> is both instrumental and music instruction, like Mrs. Lazar teaches music. Mm -hmm. This would be this point four would be on top of that. The point six at at Plimpton is also the Mrs. Lazar position over there. So we would have twice as many here if this position went forward. So it's two days of music teacher and one day of instrument, where the point four we would be looking at two days of instrument teacher because we already have full time. Yeah, my understanding is a music class, they don't, yeah. I don't know that they ever touch an instrument in yeah. a music class here. Yeah. Except for the reporter. You don't remember those painful years? <laughs> so just to make it simple, only point two of the FTEs uh -huh. at Plimpton are devoted to instrument instruction. Okay. We would have twice as many here if this were to go forward because point four okay. of the, yeah, so it's a... I get you yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think the data when you look at the high school, so like how for a previous size district, when you look at our band in the high school, it's 16 kids. It's not, I mean, we're thinking it's a small girl. It's a small girl. My concern is the instrument stuff. You know, like how do we provide an instrument? So we can get you additional information on how that's done, but I do know that at Dennett, um, they typically have a rental program, and then uh, they also did a um, instrument, instrument drive. drive. That was okay. successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have many instruments in my house. I have two trumpets, two trumpets, and clarinet. So that's how they handled it there. And I can reach out to Kingston too and see how they how would that fit in here? I'm sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Talking to Norman's question about how it fit in at Dennett, how would we fit in here if we That would be the challenge. The same thing, mm -hmm. right? It would, be a, it would be a schedule thing that, he, that we would have to work with the days that the, the teacher was available, those two days, and then work it into the schedule so that there's some sort of perhaps a rotation or a, a specific block that was devoted to that, or multiple blocks by grade level. But that's a scheduling challenge. But there's no sense in creating a schedule for a position that doesn't exist. 
but it's feasible. It's done. In fact, you, this is the only <coughs> elementary school that does not offer instrumental during the school day. Mm -hmm. So it's more than feasible because it's done throughout mm -hmm. this part of the state. Um, is it easy? No. It's, again, it's another you know, building challenge for our administrators to come up with how that would be scheduled, but it is possible. But um, just like Brian said, we're seeing that impact now at the high school with a district our size should have more than 16 students. Mm -hmm. Here, just to kind of wanted to clarify that our current math interventionist is it's, um, split between it's a 0.49 with our current local budget, and last year you proved to make it a full time position by adding the 0.51 from the ESSER grant. Um, we estimate that to be approximately $31,000, but we wanted to just point out the fact that um, the grant will eventually not be available to us. so. Currently, ESSER 3 is available until the end of June 2024. It um, could continue to be the same, but we want to kind of just put that on the radar that we will need to consider when that grant comes out, whether or not we want to absorb it in the budget. What would the ESSER grant be used for otherwise, then, if it weren't used to half on that position? No, it wouldn't it exist. Would. The grant oh, itself would. It could continue to be the same. Meaning that it, it could stay the same as it is right now because it's funded for in 23.49 budget, 0.51 from the ESSER grant. Mm -hmm. Could continue to next year, and then after that, the grant is gone. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of put that on my radar as that we'll need to kind of take a closer look at that. <laughs> this is something that uh, I think that I've you know, shared previously is, is uh, Melissa Farrell is our current elementary curriculum coordinator that's uh, a shared cost throughout the district. Uh, she services the, the four schools for 1,800 students, um, pre-K to six. So when you were thinking about adding an additional coordinator, pre-K to six, um, it would be a shared cost position. You know, that's a big, big ticket item uh, for adding a, a staff member for shared cost. Um, but Halifax's portion of that would be approximately $33,000. Are the other elementary schools proposing that, or? I, I don't, I, I mean, I've had conversations with them. I think they currently are looking at, I think that they want to, but whether or not their budgets are, are there, whether or not they could do that, uh, I'm not sure if they're quite committed for it, but I just wanted to kind of put it out there to you all is that uh, it's definitely something I think that uh, at the elementary level that it would def definitely support um, the elementary leadership team and having more than one elementary coordinator uh, would, would be beneficial to students and staff. And I think you could probably could definitely pull other districts that have elementary levels, you'd see more of this size, you would see more than one elementary per coordinator. What about a position that covers a wider umbrella? Because I, I mean, I was thinking for you and Mr. DeSantis, I thought the, the number of students was high, now you're telling me that it's actually relatively low compared to past years, but I feel like handling all of the discipline for so many students I'm not sure what that looks like, but I'm guessing it's a lot. Um, and then also all of the teacher evaluations, like what about a different position that covers a wider umbrella that isn't just a, another curriculum coordinator, but another administrator that could help with teacher evaluations or someone that could help with, or maybe even just create, go to your staff, your current staff and create like um, lead teachers for each grade level that they could assist with some evaluations and or assist with the curriculum and they get an extra stipend for being the lead teacher for each grade level or something like that rather than just I mean I don't know you know better than me I, I'm just 
I think you're doubling curriculum coordinator, that seems kind of heavy. Like I get that maybe the, you need some more help with the curriculum, but then to double it, I think is almost going too far to the other end, where you have other needs, I'm sure, with, again, staff evaluations and student discipline. Very good points. And so there are discussions at the elementary leadership team of having a coordinator <coughs> be someone that does evaluate uh, staff okay. and would help. Right? That would be, yeah, OK. It would be a huge, huge yeah. help in that sense. And I know we've, we've talked about that yeah. um, with Jill and I uh, about expanding that capacity a bit. So that's why I kind of threw it out there okay. to you all. Yeah, I think if it's something more than just overseeing curriculum, if it takes some other responsibilities off the building administrators, like doing teacher evaluations, then I think that's a great Absolutely. idea. And the teacher leader point that you made, I think, was is also something that is worth exploring, because I know that in some districts they do have stipends for teacher leaders, and they have different responsibilities. I don't know if they evaluate or not, but um, they would be, you know, they could look at look at data, and they could have curriculum meetings and things like that. Especially, do, do the teachers from each school ever get to talk to each other about what sixth grade Kingston is doing versus sixth grade? Uh, did they do have time? On district PG days, definitely. Yeah, well, Absolutely. That's once a year. <laughs> yeah. Well, so if you if you went the teacher leader route instead, then perhaps that's something that the teacher leaders could do from each building, right? The sixth grade teacher leader here could be with the sixth grade teacher leader in Kingston and and Clinton, and they could align their curriculum, make sure they're you know no matter which school you're at, in Silver Lake District, you're you know getting access to the same curriculum. Okay. I mean, I'm sure the curriculum coordinator does that to some extent, but again, just. To and I wonder if, if, if you run the finances on having teacher leaders at, at each grade level mm -hmm. across the district, mm -hmm. how it would compare to having one elementary court. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I, we haven't, as far as I know, there hasn't been teacher leader statements here mm -hmm. in, in the time that I've been here, but I, I do believe it has been, been discussed. Yeah, so, however you want it work it. I just feel that a double curriculum coordinator is kind of just going too far the other way. I, I, not to say that there's not a lot of work to be done, but I just feel like that's a big ticket to oversee what one person is technically doing right now, but I can sense that everyone's strapped. So I think the benefit of the coordinator is the ability for an administrator to evaluate. A teacher leader could not evaluate. Well, that's why I didn't yeah. see that here. Yeah, so I think if that's added in, I think that sells us a lot more if they can take over the teacher evaluations. Who would decide the teacher leader so that would be a whole lot of things to figure out who the teacher leader is for a grade That would be the building principal. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> At Silver Lake High School, the teachers, the, the lead, it was called lead teacher before they just started using curriculum department heads, but the lead teacher did do evaluations. This was probably 15, 20, like it was circa 2000. They did do that. So, I mean, I think it is possible within the Generally, they yeah, generally they tend to be in a different bargaining unit. Yeah. So because it's yeah right. No, it makes sense. But I only put this on there, and it's fourth on the list because yeah. I knew it was kind of a big ticket item. Yeah. And I knew where the other towns were currently at. So their like an order of importance to you. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So that's why I, I didn't think they're all important, but I kind of no, knew where they were. I just wanted to kind of put it out there. Any other questions? Uh, these are just some capital uh, plans, needs, accomplishments. In FY23, uh, here on the right hand side, these are <coughs> pieces that are currently in being completed or have been completed. Uh, you know, elevator control system. Kind of replacing the guts that was born last year. Um, the Indiana Comp System is currently in the works, and then the computer playground uh, that is also in the works. So we're hoping that we can pull together all those projects for the year. And then in FY24, these are some of the projects that we were considering getting a closer look at. Um, part of the kindergarten exit. Um, I think our doors open right up into the 
the playground to the sands so we're kind of coordinating, coordinating the, the exits because of our fire drills and the exit pattern that would coordinate with our kindergarten playground works that we were combine those two. I have a question about that. Yes. Didn't we just pour a pathway all the way around the in the back and it stops at the back corner over here. Um, oh, so right by the sewer. Okay. The sewers are on the far side over there. But now we're looking inside the fence okay. to connect those and then around the outside by the home flat area. The okay. outside of the pathway. So they they have a clear exit route. Right now we'll be cutting across the sand on the grass and kind of coordinate that with current plans from there. Okay. Uh, the gym bleacher replacement, uh, I think that started in possibly in that dirty years of replacing the bleachers that have been there. Uh, but Is that something that would be shared with the town, so the nature of the gym and how it's like? Or, is it or a youth and rec. Or a youth and rec, yeah. Youth and rec, and it would most likely be a barn. Yeah. So it wouldn't necessarily be a Generally, we ask for your direction as to what you want us to move move forward and, and request of the town versus what you, well, you see as a... used by so many people. It seems like, you know, why should it be there to run? You know, we can spread the love Well, we can um, put it forward as an article and tell me move forward. Yep. Yeah. So we, sometimes we do that. Been great too. He's always good at working with us, figuring out how we should join Sometimes we'll do that with capital items, like I think we did it with the phones a few years ago and, and things like that that are out, outside of our budget. We'll put it forward as a warrant article and see if the town will support it. Um, just the next one on there is the hallway floor replacement. We'll continue with what we did up on the second floor, the vinyl flooring and kindergarten. We've had a lot of success with replacing uh, the tiles that you see up here in this hallway there. Planks is just the time it takes for the custodians to strip the wax and um, one job the other. And air conditioning, fifth and sixth upstairs, it gets pretty hot in, um, in during the May, June days, even sometimes in the August, September days. Um, I'm looking at possible options for some. Um, I thought they were going to use some of the. Um, Cares Act. Yeah. What happened? Or ARPA or something. Ar yeah, ARPA. ARPA. Yeah. I thought ARPA funds were being looked into for that. Just, yeah. I, I think the ticket item on that was pretty large. I, was, yeah. I don't know where that went. Um, if they were, I mean, I think it was in the millions of dollars from what I understand. I was looking at the slide thing. Because I know that's more your decision, right? The ARPA funds? Yeah. I believe it's still on the table. I don't think any decisions have been made regarding air conditioning. And that was at the entire school, right? Was that? Mm -hmm. I think it was a $2 million, yeah. was a $2 million yeah. ticket about the, with the plans that they currently provide. But it's only 16000 to use the fitness and security. Well, we were trying to be creative and, and um, talk with other uh, school districts about um, doing window units. I was going to say, I was at, well, I was in Ludlow, and they, I, we were at the high school, and they had window units, which I know aren't the greatest, and they also have those units you just stick on the wall or whatever, I forget what those are called, but I don't know, I mean, what? what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sports, yep. yeah. I don't know, I mean, that's just, I mean, yeah, the school doesn't get hot, it's hot in the library. In this floor, it gets hot, not this It's hot back here. here, so, I mean, that was just kind of an option that we were exploring. But then, like, I mean, with the art funds, like, I know it's, like, is there a certain amount you have to spend, or I don't know what the limit is on it, but, like, if you could explore other options, you know, to use art funds, that would be pretty. Yeah, again, I know it's on the table, um, and I can talk with our interim TAs. So um, currently we have um, five Halifax students who are receiving uh, English language learner services. And 
currently the way that we provide services, because we have so few st students who need these services, uh, these services are provided by a Kingston uh, English as a Second Language teacher or English Language Learner teacher, and Halifax reimburses Kingston School's operating budget. Um, this money uh, is reflected in our teaching line. This is the part where we'd like to remind you that this is how it currently operates, mm -hmm. but the structure is based on the needs of the EL education and uh, the EL students and DESE uh, recommendations. So we, we anticipate that this will be similar next year, but this is a very difficult number to anticipate, and we wanted you to be aware of how it's currently funded and where that funding comes from in the budget. So does the ESL teacher visit here? Yes. And so then the problem could be that perhaps the ESL teacher might not have enough time if more students are enrolling. Yes. And so do you know what the number is for what we, what we pay to reimburse Kingston schools versus I think we it changes every year based on the need because yeah. we pay on an hourly basis. Hourly, yeah. We have the teacher's hourly rate and then we reimburse Kingston based on the actual hours that were spent at Halifax Elementary. What's an average number per year of students using services? Does it, is it consistent at all? It's, it's right around there. I don't think we've ever gotten over the 10 students. 10 would be high here in, in my time. Because what I mean, is it worth thinking about trying to find our own part time? ESL teacher, or is it really not? Is it we really not have enough students that would require the service? Because I mean, what if all of a sudden mid-year, right, that their ESL teacher can't provide enough hours for Kingston, and then we don't have a teacher to provide that service? I, I think you could you could probably think about a part-time right. teacher, but I don't think you're going to find someone who's willing to take a part-time position. So you could think about. You know, as you look for teachers to replace, let's say, retired teachers, maybe looking for people who have dual certification um, and making sure that you're trying to find teachers with more than one certification should the need arise, those kinds of things. But um, it's, it's, it's not, I can't, you, you could go out for a part-time teacher. Um, what about Pumpkin, do they have a significant number? They have even fewer students. I think they're at three. And yeah. how do they also? We're sharing the same model. Kingston's. They do the same thing, yeah. But should Kingston get to the point where they right. can't? That's. Is there a discussion in Kingston about hiring an additional ESL licensed? Not at this time. Teacher. Okay. But that last year we did. Oh, okay. So there's now there two. two elementary okay. ESL teachers. Which is why we're able to share the second one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. So, but as as that if that changes, or should we hear something from Kingston that would alert us to an additional need, we would bring that to you. But we, we wanted to have that conversation with you early in the event that 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 is something that could change on us without much notice. And obviously, we need to provide the services. I think we're required. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. it really makes sense. So it's something we need to be aware of. So then in his narrative, but also on this slide, um, Kane's done a nice summary of the budget items uh, that really connect very closely with our strategy for district improvement, and I turn it back to you. So like Jill had mentioned, this kind of just wraps everything together because uh, everything that, that when we're working with the budget is tied into our strategy for district improvement that we work on with Jill and Ryan and other district leadership. Um, so these components here that we were looking at adding uh, are all tied into each of our our, uh, our initiatives here for the strategy for district. They could all kind of be tied into each of them, but our building-based sub obviously would improve structures, it would build relationships. Um, there's a lot of time we're battling for you know filling those positions uh, when we can't find someone to cover classes. Our math interventionist, uh, in, it, again, will improve structures, but it also helps <coughs> with um, <coughs> emphasizing high expectations for all students. 
instructional resources support uh, that we mentioned can kind of encompass pretty much everything there. Our instrument uh, position that we asked for for grades five and up, uh, again, would uh, fall on improving structures and processes, uh, but also we would create implement our online curriculum that we don't currently have. And tech resources and capital requests, again, those kind of would fall in under a lot of different areas there, but uh, also for just tying everything together for improving our structures or having high expectations and building relationships with our students and our families. So just a reminder that this is um, the budget in front of you does not contain any of those additional positions that Kane talked about, nor does it include any of the capital re requests that were highlighted. Payroll and staffing represents approximately 82% of the regular day budget. And loss of staffing uh, or um, would obviously impact opportunities and support for students. Our next phase is really thinking about um, what direction the school committee wants to go in, um, giving us direction with regards to capital plan priorities and letting us know if there are any items that the school committee wants to move forward with in terms of um, presenting to the towns for consideration. And um, our, next, our next steps will be defined by what you'd like us to do. So we have our budget hearing in our February meeting. So are there any, anything that you would like for us to, to do for that meeting? I need to go back and look at here. Um, I would say in terms of staffing, um, I have concern about the, the um, longevity of the math interventionist. I know that that was really of high importance to our committee last year when we decided to fund that. And I guess I ask you as a, as a building administrator, like if you see, you see the impact it's having on our students and teachers, because I can imagine that support to them is beneficial as well. And if you feel that that's a strong priority of yours to keep our, our kids not only at the level, but continuing to grow moving forward, I personally think that that's something that we need to really seriously consider trying to work into our budget moving forward. Do you have any met metrics to measure the impact of the interventionalists? Um, what we do have, we'll have our benchmark data that is coming around there from the fall. We'll have it again here in the winter. Okay. So in mid January, we'll have the benchmark data that should indicate you know, various sort of increases. So that would definitely provide some type of support. Or well, like I wonder too, obviously, it's due to falling time of the pandemic and whatnot. It's just, some, I mean, it's not something we've had before, and is it something that would continue to be needed or have teachers seen a real bet? You know, obviously, any support is wonderful. Like, it's just, but a matter of prioritizing, okay, you know, they're all, you know, like we're not struggling as much anymore. I mean, and, our, and the MCAT scores are really good, so, you know, <laughs> so it's like, I don't know, you know. And I just worry about filling positions in general. Like that's, you know. It's true. It's been, it's been tough. It's been really tough. I mean, so adding more and having less isn't going to actually help anyone in the building. You know, like trying to add more and we don't even have what we need at this point. Like to fully staff the building is concerning. Did you put your capital needs in order of, your, of priority? It goes. Asphalt, bleachers, flooring, air conditioning. Um, no, not necessarily. Can you do that for us? Not right now, maybe, but That's like moving forward. I mean, I know what the condition of the bleachers are. They've been, but I can't really speak to. I mean, obviously, everybody wants air conditioning, but frankly, right. And that's that's where I mean I can 
definitely talked with, with Brian and uh, talked with Bob a little bit, Scott and Karen, and we discussed that. You can fix the L2, because I know. Um, yeah, I mean, and there, I think with, in terms of the gym, I mean, I know that we, we like rent it out to like club teams and stuff to utilize it and you know they have pickup leagues and things going on there so I mean having a conversation I think with Mr. Steele about sharing the cost between the youth and rec and the town and I mean it is our building so the school Does also Does the get any AAU? Who gets that money for any rental? Does the youth and rec or I assume it goes to youth and rec right? It doesn't go to the school. No. I would think so it does seem like it's yeah, and they have they run camps and all right. the other kind right. of stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. No, I but we also have to remember that they keep that floor like so beautiful. So I mean, they they do contribute back to the building, one hundred percent. But I mean, uh, they they just put a whole new floor down, so maybe it won't require the maintenance that it has in the past moving forward. But those are questions that we don't have the answer to. So um, yeah, those bleachers are pretty antiquated, but. Getting back to the math position, we have had two full time reading teachers in our budget for how yeah. long? I mean, this is a century of seven. So, I mean, last century was a century of literacy. So, it would make sense to have a full time math education in my mind. Yeah. Because the math building blocks, the science building blocks, will take effect in this one high school to see what the results are. Look over the last few years, math was hit by the pandemic. It was very difficult to teach math virtually. Yeah. Um, and I think we're seeing that in recovery with some of our scores, but um, very much, you know, they have been in the floor. Yeah, I wish we could give you guys everything. I know. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I wish I could just, you know. And quite honestly, like, I. I mean, yeah, I know, exactly. I really, I really do. I it's just a matter of prioritizing. You know, what's the most bang we can get for our budget? You know, like. You know. And every year we talk. I mean, I remember Joy Blackwood coming to the committee about band. Like, it's every year we talk about it, and every year it's like, oh man, we can't do it again. Well, and I think it's like I was just thinking about Plymouth North and Plymouth South High Schools have a combined band. So that kind of shows you we're not the only school with a small high school band, because those are two really big high schools that have a combined band. And mm. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, just, I, I don't, I, I, don't. I mean, I think music is super important, but it's just a matter of Math might priority. take priority. Yeah. But then music helps math. Right. So it's like <laughs> right. It is a research-based best practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I definitely, like, I, we have all our kids sign up for definitely open the school. Like, I really saw the difference. And I totally believe in it. It's just how do we accomplish it so that... And make it sustainable. Yes, because I do worry about it actually providing instruments, you know? Because I feel like when I was a kid, you had to do it how we used to do it here, where it was after school or something, you know? But obviously, if we can provide it, it would be fantastic. But Yeah, so I think if you can just prioritize those two things, the capital items and the, you know, the instrument. We already had a discussion about the building substitute, so that I think if we see success with that, I don't see our committee necessarily changing that moving forward. I, I don't, I can't speak for the future, but, um, you know, maybe once we get more comfortable with our staffing, we won't have this issue moving forward. But I, I definitely think in terms of capital items, I mean, I don't want to go to the town and overwhelm them either, so. Do you feel that you have enough uh, paraprofessional support in the building? That's not something you need <coughs> No, right now, yeah, I, think, I think we're definitely doing okay with that. Especially yeah. at so. Yep, oh. absolutely. I think it would be interesting, right? Keeping an eye on, on the DLC, which is this is the first year, so um, seeing how we can make sure that's all fully supported at all times. Again, it's, it's, it's a new program, so we want to make sure that it's, it's supported at all times. Right now, we, just, we have one special ed teacher and one paraprofessional. 
And that being said, I want to thank Marie Grable for all of all of your work to keep our kids in in house and in district, and not not just like cost savings wise, but for the benefit of the student, and it's definitely noticeable and appreciated. So thank you for everything that you do in that regard. And thank you to the administrative team for coming with a reasonable budget, like every year. That's so, right. you, you know, it's 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 nice to have a jumping off point of 2.12% and not like five, because that would require a lot of cutting. So I'm grateful that you, you all are very mindful of that. So thank you. So, <laughs> so our, our um, next item is the 23-24 school calendar. And we modeled this draft off of last year's calendar. Uh, you'll notice new teacher orientation on August 23rd, August 28th and 29th as in-service for teachers, and August 30th as the first day of school. Uh, Labor Day is September 4th, and you'll see that our early release days are circled on the calendar, and they um, fall at a, about the same time uh, as last year. And we have a I'm sorry, I'm looking for the professional development day, and it's not as easy to see at this time of night. So <laughs> I believe we put it, yes, November we put Febr 7th. November 7th is um, the first day in service for teachers, and we've returned to February 26th as an in-service day uh, for our second in-service day during the school year for teachers. That's the other change. Um, you'll notice that December um, vacation would be the 25th through the 29th. April vacation the 15th through the 19th. Um, you see the June 13th, 14th, 18th, 20th, and 21st are the um, five school cancellation days which are built in. Um, but our, our last, our tentative last day of school um, being June 12th, assuming that we don't have five snow days, right? Um, and I think those are the, the only things we have, 180 school calendar days. Italicized dates indicate no school days. Are you looking for a vote tonight of approval of the, of the draft? Um, Are we the first committee to see the calendar? You'll be the first committee to see the calendar. Okay. So generally, yes, but you could you could wait until next com next meeting to, to vote because all of the other schools will need to review and vote as well. Could we add the open houses to that calendar? They are here. Um, they are the early release days that you'll see October 26 parent conferences. No, not that one. Like the, like the back to school, like open house. Um, those traditionally have not been on the calendar. Um, right, sometimes so they'll release them on the. We could yeah. add it because I think you know just to make sure. Like, what if? You know, AGS does the same one as the middle school or whatever, and just for parents to have that up front and, you know, are sure of the date coming into the school year, uh, rather than missing an email later that, you know, they didn't realize when that date was. I just think that's much like parent conferences. It's good. Well, sometimes once the calendar's out in the fall, we kind of over the summer, a lot of the time we do kind of who's, who has what date, right. share district calendar, we kind of try and avoid. Well, the high school or the middle school or the other ones. Okay. And that's still kind of sports. I mean, do I not miss the process here for all of this? Um, I just think that'd be helpful for <coughs> parents to have that added. Um, and then at the um, Union 31 meeting, there was talk about the labeling of the days and so there was conversation about Good Friday and whether or not it should just be called no school day 
and honestly, it's like you could kind of almost just think about just doing that for all of them. You know, like what, rather than have it be an argument about whether or not we call Good Friday Good Friday, or Columbus Day Columbus Day for that matter, like what if we just said no school for all of the days off? <laughs> right? Like that, I don't know that the description even really needs to be there. I think people can look at their own calendar and figure out why there's no school. I don't know if that's something to think about just to make it consistent and even just no school. Like, for any day that's a holiday that we did. So only days are a holiday, so then we'd leave in service days and we'd leave um, um, what professional we development days. I don't know, we can think about that whenever I'm open to that, but I just think that might alleviate some of the discussion that was had at that meeting about how to <coughs> label days. Um, I don't know that the description is even really necessary. The fact of the matter is buildings closed, right? So it's a no school day. Um, but then you want to add service. open houses? Hmm? But then you want to add open houses, so we remove everything but add open houses? Open houses when the building's open, so I think it's important for people to know the building's open, right? And okay. But with a reason why. <coughs> so we're going to remove when there's parent-teacher conferences, we're going to remove, like, so you basically want to wipe everything but add open houses. I don't necessarily want to do anything. It's just that there was discussion about and renaming Good Friday that was brought up. Are you talking about holidays or because like the early release info was important. Mm -hmm. Like I mean I don't care what you're saying. I think yeah. you're saying instead of designating days as holidays. Right. Say no school. Exactly. That's I just thought that would also alleviate the concern that was brought up at the So know, like better anyway. instead? So instead of my children like their thought is better and I think that they love the idea that it's a veteran's day and memorial day for all of the fallen soldiers and friends. So I think that taking those off so where are you gonna know why I yeah. I disagree. Cool. So maybe we could just do the Good Friday then one, which is what was brought up. I mean I wasn't the one that brought it up, it was brought up at the meeting. And I thought that it was something that's going to come around anyway, so maybe we could start sort of reopening that conversation about that. Um, I'm not really interested in having that conversation. It didn't seem palatable across the district, to be honest with you, and all four committees have to vote on the calendar, so I don't have any interest in having that conversation, but if you do. Well, obviously I do, this is why I'm bringing it up. Bringing it up. Um, I just think that it could, I think the calendar could use some work as far as just consistency um, on that. And again, it was brought up by the chair of the Summer Lake School Committee. Um, so I'm sure that she probably will bring it up when it gets there, since she was the one who brought it up. I don't think that it's just not going to be revisited. The only thing I would say is uh, names of the people who are on the committees are going to have to be edited yeah. before mm -hmm. that count. But other than that, yeah. I have no input. I'm fine with the way it is. So even, I mean, just, you know, April, like spring vacation, like it just could be called, you know, April vacation, whatever, like make them more self-descriptive. I don't know, just things to think about as far as, and then December could be called December vacation or winter vacation. February will be February, April will be April. So just take out the meaning of everything. Some people 
recognize and celebrate. So, I guess if you so do we have a motion? The Good Friday, if we could change Good Friday to Annual School would be my motion. Um, okay, so make a motion. So add the open houses to the calendar. So I make a motion to add that. Well, I need a mo I need a, like a motion. So I make a motion to add the open houses to the calendar and to change Good Friday to No School Day. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed? No. Motion fails. Okay. Now I need another motion. Why does it fail with the tie, though? Just curious. It fails in a tie, doesn't it? I have to look it up. I think it fails in a tie. Could be wrong. I've been wrong before. <laughs> tie vote. We're scored in when you need them. Yeah. A majority vote is required for the motion to pass. Okay. So a tie is a fail. Okay, so now I need a new motion. Well, we can either vote to accept oh, the calendar as presented or we can... Can we... I mean, I think having it around longer is not a bad idea. Okay, well you can make it. Yeah. yeah. I think the issue was Friday, so I would make a motion to add the open houses to the calendar. And accept the rest as presented? Um, yeah, and then accept the rest as presented. Okay. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. So then we would need the other three committees, Plumpton, Kingston, and Silver Lake, to all add the open houses to the calendar. And then if not, does it come back to our committee for a vote? Or goes back to all the committees until we all agree, right? Yeah. OK. Well, hopefully that won't be too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> the other committees were to vote to change the name of Good Friday. It has to come back to us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we all have to agree on it mm -hmm. the exact same way. Okay, so now I need a motion to uh, go into executive session, or to return to regular session for the purpose of adjournment. I will make a motion to go into executive session, MDLC 38, section 21, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining for contract negotiation, and to discuss the appointment of security personnel or devices or strategies Respect there to um, also executive session pursuant to MDL 38 to comply with their act under the authority of any general or special law for a local executive session minutes of October. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, we need a roll call. Jess? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Karen? Aye. I'm um, aye. Okay. Oh, I forgot to do dates to remember, but. They're on the agenda. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.